Hello and welcome to another edition of For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. Today we are going to talk about a, a serious subject, eating disorders, and our guest for the first segment is Rebecca DeWaco. She is a clinician and she's also the director at Walden Behavioral Care. It's her first time on the show, so first of all, we welcome you to the show. Thank you. Let's talk about Walden Behavioral Care. For those unfamiliar, what is it? Okay. Walden Behavioral Care is a leader in the treatment of eating disorders um, throughout New England. And what makes us special is the fact that we have a continuum of care, which is different than a lot of other eating disorder treatment providers offer. What a continuum of care looks like is various levels of treatment depending on the needs of a patient. So for example, in Waltham, Massachusetts, we have an inpatient hospital and we also have a residential treatment center dedicated to the treatment of eating disorders. And then in different satellite locations, including our location in South Windsor, um, is where we have more of the outpatient treatment, the partial level of care, and the intensive outpatient level of care. So depending on the need of the patient, they could either go up to Massachusetts or just do outpatient stuff here in Connecticut, Exactly. Right? I exactly. think the, the, the logical next question to ask is, like a more specific definition of what uh, an eating disorder is. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that, that are confused about what it is. Yes, What definitely. is an eating disorder? Yeah, so, you know, I think that, unfortunately, when people think of eating disorders, they just think of anorexia nervosa. Mm, right. Anorexia seems to get the most media coverage um, and often can be glamorized in some way. I, I was going to ask, why is that? Is it because, like, celebrities uh, experience it, so that's why it gets covered more, maybe? Or I think in our society there's just a value on beauty and thinness in general, and so I think that um, folks that struggle with anorexia or nervosa, it's seen more. It's also most visible because of the component of somebody being underweight, so it's the most noticeable as well, but it's actually the rarest type of eating disorder. Um, the most frequently occurring eating disorder um, in the DSM-4 is referred to eating disorder not otherwise specified, which basically means that they, know, they don't fit into a little box of bulimia nervosa or anorexia nervosa and have a little bit of everything. Um, some struggles with restriction, binging, purging, overexercising, diuretics, laxatives. Um, so actually the most common type of eating disorder is, you know, the in the DSM-5, which is the newer diagnostic and statistical manual, um, is a other specified type of eating disorder. It's amazing. It's at the point where people are in categories you know, not specific, not specified, other, in other categories. That's how serious this is, where they can't even kind of get you diagnosed completely with your specific issue, right? Right. Well, what's new in the DSM-5 is that under the other category, so in the DSM-4, which is a previous edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, there was just anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and eating disorder NOS. Now in the DSM-5, they've included binge eating disorder, which is extremely significant because binge eating disorder is actually the most common eating disorder. So um, again, it is most common for somebody to have a variety of the eating disorders, but as for far as far as a specific eating disorder, binge eating disorder is actually the most commonly occurring, and it wasn't even included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual until this most recent edition. And I think most DSM people know five. binge eating as like just uh, you know eating a tremendous amount and then expelling it, I guess. And well, no, actually, binge eating disorder is, is different than bulimia nervosa. Okay. So bulimia nervosa, there has to be that compensatory method. And oftentimes, folks think of bulimia nervosa as, oh, those are the people that throw up, right? right. Yep. Well, actually, the, the binge has to be present for bulimia nervosa, and it's a compensatory um, method that either, you know, gets rid of the food. So that compensatory behavior can definitely be purging via self-induced vomiting. It can also be um, what we would consider to be a non-purging type, which could be fasting or using excessive exercise following a binge, um, which would be considered bulimia nervosa non-purge type. Binge eating disorder does not have the compensatory behavior following the binge. And binge eating disorder, folks eat a very large um, amount of food in a period of time um, that most people would not eat under similar circumstances. They eat when not feeling physically hungry. They often consume the food alone in isolation. Um, and the guilt and the shame that they feel following that binge prevents them from functioning in some way. They're not able to go to work the next day or fulfill other obligations. It really affects your life in a lot of Absolutely. other ways. The, the common 
uh, theme and a lot of the things you were describing there is a psychological aspect to yes. a lot of that, right? Yes. So it's not just the physical aspect. There's you really have to tap into a person's psyche and and kind of try to understand what's going on exactly. in their lives, right? Exactly. Now, eating disorders, they can go the other way, too, as far as weight gain, correct? Correct. And, and what are some of the, the more technical names for that? So, so folks with, again, eating disorder, um, anorexia nervosa is the eating disorder that is viewed as being the folks that struggle with being underweight. And although that's true, um, folks that maybe started at a higher weight but are engaging in restrictive behaviors and are using behaviors that interfere with weight gain could technically be anorexic under the new um, definitions in the DSM-5 by just simply engaging in restrictive eating behaviors. Also, folks with bulimia nervosa may appear on the outside to be a healthy weight. So, so truthfully, you cannot tell just by looking at somebody what type of eating disorder they're struggling with or if they're struggling with an eating disorder. Some of the things you described there, a, a person might hear what you're saying and go, you know, I've felt some of that before, but it's not as simple as eating something that you would consider unhealthy and then going to the gym because you feel guilty about it trying to burn off those calories it's not as simple as that is it no no definitely not again with with eating disorders we see you know a a marked um distress and um inability to function, not able to report to work, not able to perform obligations of the family, to care for children, um, inability to concentrate in school, um, withdrawal, apathy, no longer enjoying um, activities that they used to enjoy. I, I'm sure that uh, you know no one certainly plans to become anorexic or, or develop an eating Correct. disorder. How does it happen? How does, how does it just occur one day? That's a great question. Um, you know, oftentimes people look or think that there is this one moment in their life where they could have prevented the development of an eating disorder. And really, I like to think about it as a perfect storm. Um, you know, I think about uh, nature loading the gun and nurture pulling the trigger, so to speak. And there are lots of different um, factors that go into the developmental, the development of an eating disorder. Uh, there are biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. So a biological factor might be um, the early or late onset of puberty. Um, it might be somebody's temperament. Psychological factors could be difficulty regulating emotions. It could also be having another disorder, such as a depressive disorder, an anxiety disorder. We see eating disorders with folks that struggle with OCD, um, also ADHD. People, the eating disorder develops often as a way to cope with a pre-existing disorder. Boy, that's just one big ugly domino effect going on there, huh? Absolutely, wow. absolutely. And then depression and anxiety can also develop as the result. So it's almost a chicken or the egg yeah. uh, paradox that we get into as well. And then the social factor is really important. Um, folks that grow up in a family that has extreme values on beauty and thinness or grows up in a dieting culture, um, you know, are more at risk to developing eating disorders. Um, again, the peer pressures can be very strong as well. Just things in your life, maybe a bad breakup, a relationship issue causes you to either go up or go down in your weight significant. Certainly. Yeah. Little things like that can happen. So once you've established that you have a, a, an eating disorder, I would imagine just by uh, the, the complicated things that you described there, I would imagine treatment is equally as difficult to, to know where to start and and how to treat it. Absolutely, I think probably the most difficult thing we see is that folks engage in treatment with providers that are not specialized in treating eating disorders at first because they may seek treatment and they may call it something else or depression or um, you know, the, the primary care physician maybe doesn't notice the eating disorder. Maybe it's an athlete that always has a low heart rate um, and, and doesn't attribute the low heart rate to be due to some of the eating disorder um, symptoms. But, you know, really the most important thing is getting started with a professional that specializes in eating disorders and to be in the right level of care at the right time. A lot of times folks will go into an inpatient hospital or a residential treatment and again without the continuum of care there to support it that we spoke about earlier, they often will go to the residential treatment, think, I spent 30 days in residential treatment. When I leave, I will be cured. The family also thinks, you know, they're going to go to treatment for 30 days when they come out, everything will be so much different, they'll be better. It would be like going to a drug or alcohol treatment place. It's not just 
the 30 days that you're in there. It's the rest of your life learning to live a different lifestyle. Exactly, right? exactly. And, and often that continuum of care is so important to then support them because going from a residential treatment for 30 days to an outpatient therapist once a week um, is, is too much of a, a shift. And it's really tough because um, folks that struggle with eating disorders need that continuing structure, um, meal coaching, mealtime support, daily group therapy, um, as they continue to heal in their recovery. So, so there really isn't a cure per se, it's more of uh, maintaining a healthy lifestyle that keeps you on the right path, I guess, right? Yeah, there, people with eating disorders can absolutely achieve a full recovery. Um, and But the journey to recovery is tough. There are many twists and turns and having the appropriate care, specialized care, and completing a full continuum of care is really the best way to ensure that one can achieve that full recovery. What, what is the most prominent uh, eating disorder that you're seeing? Is there anything that's like growing that you see like maybe lately? What's going on out there? Definitely binge eating disorder is the most commonly occurring binge eating, dis um, eating disorder. And um, oftentimes folks still assume that the people that have eating disorders are Caucasian women. Um, and in fact, that is not true. Uh, with the exception of anorexia nervosa, which is again the rarest, as I said, um, there is no difference um, in culture, race, um, ethnicity in the development of any of the other eating disorders and also a lot of men struggle with eating disorders. In fact, 40% of those that struggle with binge eating disorder are male. Um, about one-third of teenage boys engage in disordered eating patterns um, and about um, 5 to 15% of those diagnosed with anorexia or bulimia are male. And I, I noticed you mentioned it seems like a lot of young people are dealing with this too, huh? It's all ages, yeah. really, um, and we're also seeing what probably is one of the scariest things is that it's starting even at younger ages. Um, Time Magazine did a study, and about 80% of children um, before they hit fourth grade are on a diet. Um, about almost 50% of 9 to 11-year-olds are sometimes or very often on a diet, and not by coincidence, 82% of their families are sometimes or very often on a diet. And we're seeing even in our clinic um, a need to start treating folks um, at 12 years old. Wow, that's amazing. Absolutely. So, so how do people come to you in the first place? How do they find out about you? What brought them to you? What method brought them to you? for treatment? Yeah, so I would say a mix of doing their own searches on mm -hmm. the internet. Um, they find us on the internet and also their providers. So it'd be a primary care physician or another outpatient uh, mental health provider referring them to us. So insurance, you know, covers what you what you offer. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we do accept most insurance companies and we also accept Connecticut Medicaid, which is so important right, to our yeah. community as well. Um, how about a website for people to go and learn more? Absolutely. Um, you can definitely find us at www.waldenbehavioralcare.com. What's on the website for people to see? So you can see all the different locations of the satellite clinics, and you can also see the different levels of care, general information up on eating disorders, and um, information for loved ones as well. All right, Rebecca DeWaco, clinician and also the director at the Walden Behavioral Care. Thanks for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. We'll take a break and come back. I'm Sean Murphy. This is For the Record. Stay with us. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. We are still talking about eating disorders. In our second segment, we have Mary Curran, who is a walk coordinator for a big walk that's coming up, and we will get to that shortly. First of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, but we always say whenever someone is involved in any kind of fundraising event or an event in general, it's usually there's a vested interest on their part, and certainly your life has been affected, even if it's not yours personally, somebody close to you has been affected by an eating disorder. Talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, when uh, one of my daughters was 16, um, we realized that she had a problem, and uh, we took her to the doctor, and the doctor said, I think she has an eating disorder, and I was uh, very naive. I mean, I really didn't know what she was facing. I said, you know, Honey, I'm sure we can fix this together, and um, I was kind of clueless, but uh, without really doing any research or background yeah, I just sort it. of thought, well, I'll I'll, have to, I'll try to cook better, or right. um, you know, and and that wasn't it. We'll I use the low fat stuff. Or whatever, yeah, exactly, yeah. and and that was totally not it. What I didn't realize that that you know it was a, it was actually 
some very um, some issues with anxiety and depression and um, you know just as uh, Rebecca said a perfect storm of all sorts of uh, issues so really that was just the tip of the iceberg but um, I began to educate myself I, I read a lot and um, and uh, you know luckily we were able to get her uh, the treatment she needed you know good uh, um, eating disorder professionals so um, now how long ago was this by the way well, um, this was about nine years ago. The reason I ask that question is, was there as much information available back then when you did start doing research on it as there is now? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, you know a whole lot more now than you did then. What, what was available out there for you to, to kind of There do was research? not much yeah. in terms of information. There were very few treatment centers. There's, uh, there's been a lot that's come to Connecticut since then. Um, uh, I was fortunate to go online and find the National Eating Disorders Association and uh, so I was able to get quite a bit of information. But, um, you know, I think in the uh, past 10 years, there's been a lot of uh, progress toward erasing the shame and stigma. And I think that's a biggie. Ah, uh, yeah, there's yeah. that. And also, I, I, what I would describe as the pride factor, people, uh, you know, coming out and admitting that they, you know, because sometimes people are too proud to admit that they have a problem, whether it's anything, drinking, drugs, eating disorders, and, you know, if you can admit that you need to take the next step to get help, that's huge because there are support mechanisms out there, aren't there? Exactly. And, um, you know, I think my daughter was shy about telling, coming to me that she had a problem. And then I was a bit horrified and embarrassed and, you know, is this somehow my fault? I think all parents sort of, you know, wonder what we did to cause this. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, it took a long time to realize that it really... You know, it's not our fault, and it's just, you know, many, many factors. Right. And that we actually are, are key to uh, helping in the recovery of our child. So. How important is that for the, for the people around the person suffering, dealing with it, to be that support mechanism? I mean, it's huge, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, extremely important. Um, they need you so much to just show um, unconditional love, get them the treatment they need. Um, there's, there's, as you know, there's a lot of shame involved. There's a lot of guilt um, so it's, it's, it's a real challenge as a parent. Is it also something where people, you know, might not necessarily take it serious and don't think it's a real problem in eating disorder? Well, that's easily fixed, you know? That's not like the real issues of the world, and they don't take it as seriously as they should. And, you know, that's one of the saddest uh, situations I see is when parents, even a child will finally screw up the courage to come to the parent and say, I'm struggling with something, and the parent says, no, you're fine. You know, or, or uh, they just don't recognize it, or they are in denial. And, you know, that's what's really a shame, is that child is not going to get the kind of support they need. Now, you, this is key. You said this before. Do you actually see, from the time that you discovered it and started doing research on it, do you see legitimate progress being made? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's been, as Rebecca says, it's been... Uh, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Sure. It's definitely not a straight line in recovery. Um, she's nine years now into recover recovery, and I think um, she has learned valuable skills along the way from her treatment team, you know, how to deal with the thoughts and the feelings and those things that cause the behavior. So, um, but it definitely is key to get somebody very experienced in eating disorders. Now, so you did the research, you learned about it, you were very supportive of your daughter, but then that wasn't all you did. You, you got into it to the point where you wanted to try to help make a difference yourself. And one of the ways is, is and, a, and a lot of organizations do this, uh, they put on fundraising events and a lot of them happen to be uh, walks. And you have one that you're doing, and it's been. This is a third year now. Third year. Let's talk yes. about that walk. Well, we're very excited. Um, three years ago, it was the uh, first in Connecticut. We now have about 60 across the country, um, and so this is yes, our third year. Um, we've had 200 over 200 walkers the last couple of years, and it uh, looks like we're on track for that again this year. So um, we're really excited. We have a great program this year. We have. Um, uh, Dr. Margot Main is uh, she's an international expert, um, founding member of the National Eating Disorders Association, and a clinician in West Hartford. And uh, she'll be sp um, speaking briefly about the clinical aspects of eating disorders. We have um, the Fox sisters flying in from Nashville, and they're uh, um, one of them. Um, Nat um, Alexa Falk struggled with an eating disorder, and so um, uh, they should be a highlight. Uh, of the program and then we have Miss America 2008 and that was her platform when she was um, became Miss America's her battle uh, 
against her eating disorder. So I'm really excited. Got some celebrities at this yeah, event, exactly. huh? Exactly. Um, and how has it grown from the from year one to year now? There's always things that you learn. Maybe a few things that you discover fall through the cracks. Little tweaks that you make. Yep. What's different about it now? Well, it's um, what's great is the number of sponsors. We now have. Um, Ten sponsors, I think. So, a, are these a lot corporate of, sponsors? A, um, a lot of treatment centers, okay. um, because they they realize that we're here to stay. We're we're doing it every year. Uh, it's a wonderful chance for the um, uh, the walkers to under to to find out more about the uh, uh, treatment um, professionals available in Connecticut. And it's it's gone from almost zero to, in terms of sort of um, you know, um, day programs and outpatient and that kind of thing. It's really. Um, grown and grown, which is excellent. We really needed some more in Connecticut. So a walk usually, obviously it's a way to raise funds, but it's also a way to raise awareness for people to kind of learn and just also maybe come and support. Maybe someone is unable to participate in the walk itself, or maybe they can be there just for moral support too, right? Yeah, exactly. Are you also looking for volunteers? Yes, we are. Always, right? So, yes. Always. Like, we, what would you be needing from people? If uh, you we could always use uh, people to help set up tables, register, clean up. Um, so you can go on the website and uh, get in touch with me, and uh, we'd love to see you on the 27th. Where is the walk? Give me the what, where, when, and yeah, how. Yeah, it's on um, uh, September 27th. Uh, registration's at 11. It's a Saturday. It'll be at the uh, West Hartford campus of UConn, and um, and it goes to about one o'clock, two o'clock. Rain or shine? Yes, it will. But although we are knocking on wood, hoping for a we nice are going to have sun. You are. You are. Yeah. It's, a, it's not definitely. if. It's definitely going That's to. That's right. Exactly. Baby strollers, all that stuff. Yeah. Bring stuff. your dogs. Dogs on yep. leashes. If, That's uh, good too. We've so we've got little bandanas. So little Nita Max band can uh, walk in it too. Exactly. Right? We'll have water bowls and all that. So. That's excellent. Yeah. Uh, and Rebecca, from the first segment, wanted to mention that she'll be in this uh, walk this year too, right? Yes. Right. I'm hoping the whole Wallen team will come as well as another. Uh, other teams as well. Now, as the walk coordinator, what is your role and what is your job in all this? Are you are you working right up until like the almost the walk begins? I mean, are you still tweaking things now? On, I am. On the last I'm, uh, uh, I've been working with some volunteers. We are. Um, I have a PR volunteer. I have somebody helping me finding sponsors. Well, you're the PR person. You're coming on the show. Exactly. Today. Exactly. Yeah. So we work together. Um, I've been putting posters up all over. You know the Hartford, West Hartford area. Um, so yes, and then I'll be putting up tables the day of. So I'm sort of wearing lots of hats. Yeah, well, you you would anyway. What does it take to put together a walk like this? Now it's probably a little bit easier for you now. This will be your third year doing it, so you've learned what to do and what not to do, right? right. You right. said that you said you know uh, sponsors. There's more sponsors. That's great, especially in lieu of the fact that. You know, we were in a recession not too long ago. Maybe some people might say we still are. Um, people are still willing to come out and give and show support uh, even through all that, right? Oh, absolutely, because I think people are discovering um, that, in fact, one of our themes has been everyone knows someone. And right. I think that has, now that people are starting to talk about this, it's coming out in the open and people are saying, ah, you know, I know somebody, I have a cousin, I have a... Uh, maybe, you know, a, a boyfriend or whatever, you know, and it's, um, so I think that's the delightful thing is there are walkers, but then there are all the people that are donating to their walk and hearing about the walk. And so, you know, finally words getting out there. Is this one of those things where you can put together teams or is it just everybody Absolutely. just walks individually? Or? Yeah, no, we have many, many teams. Okay. We're giving out um, three prizes for the top three fundraisers and a prize for the top team. So I'm hoping that we'll, uh, people will, compete against each other to uh, do Now, how long does it take to put something like this together? All right, say, let's say this walk happens, all right? Mm -hmm. Walk is over. You take a little break. How long before you start planning the next one for the next year? I, I started each year about in April, okay. lining up the venue. And uh, and then, of course, there's always the last two months of the, the busiest ones. So six months, like half the year is spent, you know, in some capacity putting right. together this walk. Exactly. No, wow. you know, it's not right. that intense. But um, I... I have a lot of help from the National Eating Disorders Association. We have a walk coordinator, and um, she's been wonderful at just helping me with all the logistics and the insurance and that kind of thing. And now this walk is is the one that's coming up, and uh, but it, but that's not the only fundraising event that uh, that is for this, right? And you you do other stuff too, right? Exactly. That's yeah. um, uh, one of the only things in Connecticut. But I also am. Uh, chairing for the second year. I'm chairing our gala. We have an annual gala in New York City. Wow. Um, so that was very successful. Last year we raised over 700,000. Um, we have a conference every year. This, uh, the one uh, mid-October is going to be in San Antonio, Texas. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, as I say, about 60 walks across the country. So 
Good stuff. Yep. All right, well, let's take one more break and come right back. I'm Sean Murphy. This is For the Record. Stay right there. So that is our show for today. Mary, I want you to give out the website for people to learn more about the walk and hopefully be able to participate in it. All right, it's nationaleatingdisorders.org. And that's it. Hopefully you'll be out and about supporting. It's for a great cause. Mary Curran, I want to thank you for being on the show Thanks today. Thanks so much. Good luck with the walk this year, too. Thank you. That is our show. You can see this show and many others on our YouTube site. Until next time, I'm Sean Murphy. This is For the Record. Take care.